Hello, so we are in the beautiful city of Uyo, Akwaibom State, a state where innovation meets opportunity. Today, we take a closer look at the future of cybersecurity in Nigeria, right here in the midst of a growing tech hub. In this video, I sit down with Nyena Kwangwe a cybersecurity expert and one of the lead instructors in the Nigerian government 3 million technical talent initiative. Together, we will explore how this initiative is building the next generation of cybersecurity professionals, and we will dive into some of the most pressing challenges and opportunities in the field. So, join me as we uncover how Nigeria is preparing to lead in the world of cybersecurity. We are told that there are over 500,000 openings in the US alone, cybersecurity roles. Yeah. So how do you get these roles filled? It's not that the people don't want to hire, but where do you get the talents to hire? So we are training them on how to use tools like Microsoft Copilot for security, as well as other AI tools to simplify the work and then do more. Mm. So you are moving more efficient. You are doing more with less. That means that tells you that we need to build capacity mm. in training people to be able to use AI tools and give the malicious actors a good run for their money. If you're talking about building security talent in Nigeria, you're looking at center of excellence. Mm. Center of excellence, wherein, let's say, for example, every state in Nigeria would have one center of excellence for cybersecurity. All right, guys, welcome back to the channel. Uh, thank you for clicking this video. If this is your first time, please do want to like the video and subscribe to the channel because we are bringing exciting tech series like you already know. Uh, yeah, I'm going to bring a lot of IT professionals right on this channel. So do want to like and subscribe to the channel for more. I have a special guest today. Mr. Nyerepong Kamden. Welcome, my brother. Thank How you. are you? I'm very fine indeed. Good, very, very good, fine. Good. So, we are in Uyo, Akwaibom, State, Nigeria. Right. How is uh, Uyo in the first place? I think the environment, everything is just lovely coming yeah. back from the UK. <laughs> well, this is a very interesting environment to be in. It's peaceful. I mean, it's one of the most peaceful states in Nigeria. We don't have all the skirmishes that we've been hearing about. It's a place where we have very industrious people. We also have people that, are, that, that live like brothers and sisters, essentially. So, it's somewhere that you can actually sleep with both eyes closed. So, I mean, Uyo is a very good. And it's a, also a place where you have budding tech talent okay so people that um not just getting into tech but are trying to make a mark in tech so it's a place that favors both business tech ecosystem and even people that want to come here for holiday i mean the current governor of the state is very bullish on on tourism and so we're looking to having a state that will be a home of the tourist destination in nigeria right okay right we are talking about tech on this series uh, where I bring a lot of uh, IT professionals to kind of educate my audience and encourage them. It can be to get into tech, it can be to pursue a career in tech and yeah, all that. So you are a cyber security analyst and instructor. Yes. Can you kind of tell us more about your profile? Okay, yeah, my name is Sekanem, like I said earlier. I, I am a cybersecurity professional, both an analyst as well as an instructor. I started my career um, as an undergraduate, I mean, I studied electrical engineering in the University of Berlin, Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And then from, you know, from studying electrical engineering, I decided to specialize in telecommunications. Um, after that, I started working with Abuja Electricity as a, of course, it was more of a managerial uh, position uh, before I left to focus on software engineering. Okay. I did software engineering um, after, immediately after my work at Abuja Electricity and then eventually went into blockchain development because software engineering is like it helps you to be, you can be a front end, a very good at front end and back end um, professional. But I decided to go into blockchain because that actually got into when, I mean, people were talking about, I was very, got very interested in blockchain technology that I decided to make a career out of it, got into blockchain. Uh, but something changed. 
um, while I was doing blockchain on the side, I was also doing AI because I saw the nexus between blockchain and AI. So I was also doing something around AI. And then I got my first application. I worked with a small team, mm -hmm. and then we got. I got my first application uh, launched. But I mean. Um, I didn't know that some people were actually waiting for me to launch the application. So I will, the moment I launched the application, it was taken down. Wow. Malicious actors just took it down immediately. I mean, as a software engineer, you know, we don't consider so much, maybe let me say personally, I really didn't consider so much around cyber security. I just believed that, I mean, just build your app and put it out there. Mm. Uh, and then, but I was told, a very, I learned a bitter lesson. I was told that, no, no, it doesn't work that way. You have to consider cybersecurity. So I got that attack and I, it was a very bad one for me. Um, subsequently, I was also, you know, when I got that attack, I, I was kind of pinched very hard, but I really didn't consider it as, as, as a big deal. I kept on doing things. I was building websites for a number of organizations and all that. And then one day I woke up in the morning, I got like more than six, I don't think more than 60 minutes ago, but there were a ton of calls. Um, and that was because five of my websites were, were hacked mm -hmm. immediately, as in simultaneously. Five of my websites were attacked. Ah, you know, that was like the last straw that, that broke the camera's back. So I was like, no, I have to find out what to do to prevent this thing from happening and that's what ignited my interest in cyber security and from that time um i, I started of course to learn cyber security but i i just knew that if i'm going to have to get back at the people that did this to me i can't do it alone mm -hmm. so the best way um to do this uh, to go on this revenge mission was to train other people so we can build an army of security professionals okay. that will go after the malicious actors that was what ignited and still sustains my interest in cyber security team today wow that's uh, a brilliant uh, changeover so how was the change process like how did you find it because i believe you must have spent a lot of years in software and blockchain like how many years did you change and how did you find that changeover because a lot of people will feel like okay I've spent a lot of years already in software why am I moving to cyber security okay um, actually um, yes you that I would say software engineering actually gave me some background because if you look at cyber security for instance one of the things that you learn in cyber security is Python okay. and Python allows you to automate security tasks mm -hmm. yes so I already had that explore that background in, in, in software engineering Linux for example which is uh, a virtual machine which uh, allows us to um, do malware, conduct malware analysis in an isolated environment. I already had that experience mm -hmm. because of my background in software okay. engineering. Okay. So software engineer, I would say, gave me that background to be able to excel in cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. So for example, um, cybersecurity typically, typically takes one year, one, or one to two years to learn to the level mm. which I got to, but I did it in three months. Wow. Because I already had this background. So, uh, well, there's a caveat to that three months because the three months I did, I did 17 hours every day. I did 17 hours every single day. That's what I put in throughout the period I learned cybersecurity. That's like locking yourself inside. I, I did not have a life for three months. I did not have a life from Mondays, Monday through Sundays. I did not have a life for three months, and I was able to get my certifications in cybersecurity. And then I was also because I was doing that. I was on, I was not doing this out of convenience. I was doing this to get back at the people that dealt with me. And I knew that the best to do the best way to do this is to be so skilled mm -hmm. that I will be able to train other people to also do join the army okay so it's more of the driver here is i want to make a statement in cyber security and that's why i could spend as much as 17 hours you know that that's just it so the transition was not such a big deal it was not such a, a dramatic one because i already had experience in software engineering so i just had to move from building applications to protecting applications and protecting systems and networks okay Good. So currently you are like uh, you are an instructor, cyber security instructor, educating the the younger population just to get into this field. Yes. And you are with the three MTT. Three MTT. MTT government yes. Program. Yes. How did you get into this, and how are you finding it? Okay. So three MTT um, came because you know when you 
when you do something out of passion you know the difference is clear mm. so it turned out that i it was what it was actually one of my students that i taught because i, I don't teach just in 3 mtt i, I teach in other tech hubs for cyber security so one of my students happened to know the person that is that person in, I, I don't know anybody in the federal ministry at all mm. so it was actually a referral someone said if you are looking for a cyber security instructor look no further i have one for you. i have somebody someone for you that is he knows his onions and because this person actually the guy is actually in blocking he, he, he builds a decentralized application that is the equivalent of fiverr so the, the application works uh it's where people can actually work um freelancers can work but in a decentralized way wherein you are you get paid in crypto assets you know because if you look at nigeria for example if you if you're a freelancer in nigeria you'll be told to go to paypal there are a lot of things that there are a lot of challenges you'll have in receiving payments mm. so this guy saw that market he saw the problem there mm. and so decided to he knew that web3 could actually be a solution because i mean if you want to pay someone in crypto it is instantaneous so the guy that was the, the guy he actually had to learn how to the cyber security component because i mean cyber security is even more important in web3 than web3 because um this is is decentralized meaning that everybody has access to the code mm. yes so it's very very important so he had he came in as one of my students and so when this opportunity came he just made that recommendation and since that time i have lived uh, up to expectation i have actually trained more than the first batch we trained almost 300 people and currently we are doing 500 uh, fellows on cyber in cyber security okay uh i think this was intro introduced uh, by this current uh, yes. administration yes right so i think they have a foresight into the security problems in nigeria and they kind of introduce this which is quite recommendable what is the aim and objective of this program okay the program is to actually meet the skill gap that exists okay the program is called three mtt three million technical talent the idea is that the minister boson tijani mm -hmm. the minister of communication innovation and digital economy believes that there is a, a there's a gap that needs to be filled if you look at China used to take up some of these roles, these low-end roles, mm -hmm. uh, but now they are moving into more high-end roles. These roles are there, and we need a pipeline of talents to fill this role. And some of these roles could be very lucrative, for example, like cybersecurity. Um, and if you also look at the exchange rate in the Nigeria Naira and the US dollar, mm -hmm. I mean, for someone that is able to earn in US dollar, it, it, it makes him to be more comfortable really and beyond that it also helps to boost the nigerian economy because when people earn in dollars the pressure and when you have of course forces of demand and supply when there is more dollar to spend the pressure on the naira will reduce so that in itself it was an opportunity that the minister saw and how can you do this i mean we are told that there are over five hundred thousand openings in the u.s alone cyber security rules yeah. so how do you get these rules filled it's not that the people don't want to hire but where do you get the talents to hire mm -hmm. so this program is actually the 3m theater program is a deliberate plan it's a deliberate effort by the minister of communication technology um to see how he can close that gap train 3 million between uh, last year 2023 and 2027 the target is to tra train 3 million nigerians in technical talents with the hope of getting them to fill some of these rules that exist and so far the program has been very phenomenal i mean we have I currently I have students that are working. Some of them are working in banks as security analysts currently. Wow. Some of them are working as interns in foreign companies. A number of them have had such roles. So, in which means that um, it is something that is working. And then another thing is that they give a global standard. The curriculum is of global standard. Students, people that are trained in that program, mm. get to they can work anywhere. I mean, some of the students that are working in companies outside nigeria as interns you know which means that of course if you don't have the skill that matches what they need in the industry you can't really work there so the program has worked work very well so far and i believe that the ministry is committed to ensuring that this they see through to having three million technical talents by 2027.
Right. I live in the UK as a tech person. I've observed a lot of things happening between the UK and the Nigerian scene. Mm. We have this challenge of, okay, we have the talent here, we train our talent, and the UK and US are smashing these guys. So, I don't know, <laughs> how do we, <laughs> because it feel like the global talent visa, you see that these guys are taking so much talent from Nigeria. How do we balance this? Because are we training people for the Westerners? Okay, so you, there are certain things that we should look at. We are not the first people that started it. Um, China did that deliberately. India did that deliberately. I will tell you for a fact, that if you take out India, you take out um, the Philippines, you take out Thailand and some of those other countries uh, from fiber, fiber will crash. Wow. I'm telling you, they have the majority of the talent there on fiber. So I, I don't want to, I want us to look at the fact that number one, the world is a global village. Nowadays, I don't even need to travel out to work, you know, outside the Nigeria. Mm. So the thing there is that we're looking at producing the talent i mean take a look at the u.s the top companies tech companies in the u.s <laughs> they are being led by indians yeah you can mention microsoft you, there are a number of them you can google, mention yeah. google and all so you have that india these people have trained because they are very deliberate in training talent mm -hmm. if you go to indian institute of technology it's one of the best in the world it's sec i think it's second only to caltech and mit of course so these guys are very deliberate about training talent and so of course like they say knowledge is power when you don't if you are not able to rule the world by military might you can rule the world by talent if india decides to withdraw their talent from the world the, from the global space i mean it will so a lot of things will crack so I, I believe that nigeria should look at producing those talents hmm. let those people get out there and provide the services when you provide the services, you earn in dollars. We, repatriation will increase. What we call foreign direct investment will increase. Because, I mean, everybody that goes out there knows that, I mean, they are not from there. So the, the idea is to earn from there and then look at what you send back. Yeah. That is why, I mean, if you look at when between some administration before, the, we had, Nigeria actually had, well, in terms of diaspora remittances, we had a, a, a very big chunk. All of a sudden, that dwindled. So, we are looking at how we can train talent, let, let them go out there and, and send back. And that will in, increase diaspora remittances. And by extension, of increase. Let me tell you one thing that is making the make a lot of pressure on the Naira. So many people are trying to leave Nigeria. Yeah. And so, you don't have a, a, there's a mismatch between dollars flowing out and dollars flowing in the only uh, revenue earner external revenue earner which is oil because of the oil theft i mean it's 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 actually nibbling away at what we can earn from there so the other place we could look could look at is talent yeah. export talent and import what the hard currency import foreign exchange and that makes you to be more competitive as a matter of fact Yes, when you have talent, you are more competitive. You have access, even Nigerian companies, companies that choose to be, uh, to work in Nigeria, to base in Nigeria, will have very high quality talent at their beck and call. They will have high quality talent, uh, in, you know, within reach. Mm -hmm. If you go to the US, you go to San Francisco, I mean, you over there, that's where you have the Silicon Valley. You Talent is almost everywhere. Why some companies can't even move from San, from California by extension is because talent is readily available. So how can we replicate something of that, that nature in Nigeria? Where if you want to start a business now, um, then you know that you can readily find talent. Hmm. I have a friend that wants to start, that actually wanted to start a, a business, a tech firm in Nigeria. But the question is, where do you get the quality ta talent? You see how to go resort to hiring some Indians, hiring people from outside the country to do this work. And it's going to pay them. Imagine working in Nigeria and earning Nigerian Naira, and you have to pay your employees in foreign currency. You are almost, um, you are almost going to run at the law. So if we have Nigerians domiciled in Nigeria that are trained, hmm. yeah, definitely some will go out. Out, but some other people will be inspired by people that have even gone out to actually set their eyes on, on, on tech. And that will mean we build a good talented, good talent pipeline that local companies can source from. Okay. 
So, from your point of view, what are the challenges? Challenges that you have seen so far? It can be from the student, or maybe the program, the way it's organized, or yeah, administration, or whatsoever. What are the key challenges? Yeah. So the challenges, most especially, is access to devices. Yes, the 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 ministry is doing some programs like knowledge showcase. Mm. It's like a competitive program. If you if you win, you get a device. But for most people. Um, they don't have access to device and devices are because of the exchange rate devices are ridiculously expensive yes. um, In Nigeria, Naira, the best a good device for cyber security because again Learning cyber security there, there's a spec of device that you need to do that program very well and very effectively And so the minimum requirement the device that meets those minimum requirement uh, is out of the reach out of reach for the ordinary, the average Akwaibom person, the average Nigerian. So access to device is very uh, critical, very difficult for people around here. Um, ALCs have been actually been asked to provide the devices, but again, I mean, you, for example, we had over the 500 students mm. that we're dealing with. I mean, think about having providing 500 devices. That would be a, a tough one. Besides, when the you know that when you talk about tech. The, the major learning actually happens when you leave the training center, mm -hmm. happens at home. So even if you're providing them with devices when they come to learn, mm -hmm. we, we, we do that training for about four hours or thereabout. Then when they come to learn, what happens when they go back home? If they don't have the devices when they go back home, then it becomes difficult for them to really learn at the speed that you want them to learn. Mm -hmm. So device is one of the th challenges that we have in that program. Then the other thing is even access to some of the course materials. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's been a few challenges because of manpower. The, you know, the, the, the administrators the, of the program, they're short of manpower. I mean, you're having 3 million students. This cohort alone, we are looking at 300,000. So you're having 300,000 uh, fellows that you have to deal with. Hmm. So um, manpower is a challenge too. Um, though the ministry is doing a lot to try to close that gap. I mean, though, but there's that lead time. And sometimes when you're encouraging someone to do, to learn a particular skill, um, except, except they have that passion, any little challenge they face, they just walk away. Yeah. So that could be, a, that's, that's a challenge. So um, what it takes, that, that lead time that exists between having a, a, a challenge I'm, that's, I'm talking to the, about the fellows now. If the fellows having a challenge and getting that challenge fixed mm. could lead to some discouragement. So that's those are the major challenge they have uh, that exist in the program. But outside that, I mean, the program is completely free. You don't pay a single dime to be part of the program. But okay. those challenges around device and all those things still remain. Okay, as a cybersecurity professional yourself, let's look at outside. 3 MTT. Okay. What are the challenges that a normal cybersecurity trainer that is kind of okay? I finished. I've learned this model. I understand everything. What challenges are they facing? So the the challenge they are facing is the the you know the transition from um, especially for people that don't have any technical background. Mm. It's it's a bit challenging for them when you put up a few things that. You know, there are some people, I, let me give you an example. Hmm. One of my students told me, I, I want to do cybersecurity, provided there's nothing like coding. Okay. Yeah, so that's what he told me. He said, I'm <laughs> going to do cybersecurity, provided there's nothing like coding. But you and I know that, I mean, you are protecting computers, mm -hmm. uh, except for some non-technical aspects, which you don't even, you those non-technical rules are, are not even available at entry level. These are specializations. For example, yes. if you are doing GRC, yeah. you get your entry, entry level certification first before you begin to look at specialization. So, which means that you have to expose yourself to some level of programming. Mm. You know, you learn Python, you learn SQL, you learn Linux, you know, to interact with an OS um, and a virtual machine. Mm. So, that challenge in, in terms of moving from the <laughs> what you've learned, the theoretical part of it, to the practical aspect of it some students are naturally very scared even if it's going to be very cheap you know i've seen a situation where by you know, ah is it this one that they say is so difficult you know that initial shock the fear i mean anything that has to do with tech mm. it's always i mean when you look at in films that depict cyber security nine out of ten times you see someone sitting down in a dark room with a hood uh, you know hunched by a, a screen you know typing a lot of uh, codes 
you know and that's the how people look at cyber security they think it's all about penetration testing so by the time they see that something is in fact there was a student that i gave you an assignment and he knew the answer to the question but he did not tell he, he didn't he didn't respond i said why then when i gave him the answer he said i knew this now but i did not give the answer because i was thinking this could it could be that this cheap do you understand? Mm -hmm. So that bias, that negative stereotype around security that ah, it has to be cyber security has to be very complex, ridiculously complex because of what is in the media, mm -hmm. has scared a lot of people away from security. Mm -hmm. And so even when they're coming to learn, that challenge, that 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 fear, that phobia is still there. Mm -hmm. So they 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 are any small anything any small challenge that they face, they are just waiting to walk away from the from from the from the profession so that i could say is one of those things moving from the theoretical aspect of security to the practical aspect of security so the the program kind of cover the practical that's what we are well. yeah so what the program is structured this way um students are onboarded mm -hmm. and then they are given about three two three months mm -hmm. to go through the online learning program the online learning program this program they are the, the, the ministry pays for it 100 percent okay yes yeah, so all they need to do they provide them with access login details so they log into the pro the platform Coursera, ibm uh, you know they, they a lot of programs google cyber security certificates are available for them okay. the uh, ibm cyber security pro, uh, certificates even the uh, the cisco security certificate is available these courses are available to them free of charge so once they're done with that program that's a theoretical though it has it labs including the programming you know inside of the program but that's those are labs but we try to give them the real world world experience by having ALCs applied learning clusters that these students these fellows will come in um once or twice a week in person they come in to actually get the practical experience mm. from people that are in the industry not just tutors but people that are in the industry that know exactly what applies in the industry so that's what they're coming to do and then um they are able to do those practical uh work and then they get um tested they get some assignments they get some 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 quizzes and all that and then the attendance also is very important because i mean if you don't come if you don't, cannot show up to a training program an in-person training program then i mean how would you how, how are we guaranteed that you'll be able to have that responsiveness when you actually get the job itself so we try to ensure that that is compulsory you miss 70 percent before you can be said to have passed through the program so it's it's a what i would say it's an in-person program that is very focused on giving the students practical experience real world experience you saw you were in class today you saw exactly how students were asked to do things on their own yeah i mean i as the instructor i, I literally just tool and watch what was going on uh -huh. so having the students to talk about what they learned as well as how that how, how relevant that is to the cyber security industry that's what the program is focused on all right let's look at uh, the emerging cyber security threat and trends okay right there are a lot of them now as long as ai is becoming a big thing now yes in in the tech industry yeah what are the kind of skills that this program will help them in relation to okay probably they finish the program they can practically get into this field and resolve some of this yeah okay so one of the things that we do is that one of the things the courses that they do is they do ai career essentials okay yes yeah, so we in that program we teach them how to use ai i mean let me give you an example when i learned cyber security I used a, a tool called Splunk. Okay. I used to you use what we what we call SPL, mm. search processing language. That is what you use to interact with Splunk. But nowadays, Splunk has an LL, LLM, that's a large language model attached to it, meaning that if you want to query Splunk today, for let's say failed login attempts between so as an, a particular hour and the other, you write it in natural language. You literally write it in English language, and then the LLM actually processes that information, changes it to SPL, which is used to query Splunk, and then the response comes out. So what we are now even training our students to do is to train them how to interact with large language models, mm. prompt engineering, which is part of the program that we do.
now the reason why we're doing this is because think about it this way the malicious actors are li really leveraging ai mm. i mean before now it would take what would take a malicious actor before now three four days to do he can do it in 30 minutes because of ai so if you don't train your own people to know how to use this AI tool, then it becomes a problem. Yeah. Um, I, what I currently use at work now is what called Microsoft Copilot for security. And that actually does a lot of the work that security analysts do. Mm. To be honest with you, it does a lot of the work. You do a malware analysis, even do it and even print out a report. It will do log analysis. It will do a lot of things that a security analyst would do. Mm. So um, the, 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 the thing there is that we are not even looking at training a security analyst to go and do some of the, the repetitive work anymore. We are training them on how to use tools like Microsoft Copilot for security as well as other AI tools to simplify the work and then do more. Mm. So you are, you are moving more efficient. You are doing more with less. So let's say you would have needed to hire about, let's say, 20 um, security analysts. With AI, you can hire five. Okay. I know you would say ah that that happens to cut trim the job market, but the reality is not so. There are a lot of functions that need security that people are not really looking at. I mean, if you look at in the past from February till now, mm. we've had more than five high profiled ransomware attacks. I'm talking about no around the world, I mean. Okay. I, I'm talking about ransomware attacks that have uh, people have had to pay over two twenty million dollars. I mean, we had um, um, Sinovis, we had um, SD, CDK, we had um, uh, uh, you know Change Healthcare. We have a number of ransomware attacks that have happened this year alone, and we are not even done with the year yet. So that means that tells you that we need to build capacity mm. in training people to be able to use AI tools and match, give the malicious actors a good run for their money. That's what, for me, is very important. It's not just to teach people. I mean, I know what you know. But what you can actually leverage is what you don't know that I don't know. Mm. So that's exactly the point. So AI for us is an enabler. It's, it's, it's an enhancer, which we expose our students to, to ensure that they are trained to function very appropriately okay. anywhere in the world. Uh, I think this program will kind of... Uh Boost the cyber security sector in Nigeria in and of course in the coming years. Yes. Uh, looking at Russia and Israel and so many other countries that are very very good in this field. Yeah. How long do you think we can get to this? Yeah, the level that they are. Like, what can we do as a government? What can the government do to kind of take us to that level? So I would say baby steps. I I I, I would say that I appreciate the deliberate work the minister is doing yeah so if you look at these countries you're mentioning these guys are not approaching cyber or tech or specifically cyber security as as something that they're just doing it it's a national security plan for them yeah it's a national security plan so except it's a you get more from what you give more except nigeria really looks, looks at cyber security takes cyber security as a national security objective then it will be you know because again if you're talking about building security talent in nigeria you're looking at center of excellence mm. center of excellence wherein let's say for example every state in nigeria would have one center of excellence for cyber security so you have that talent pipeline that ensures that you are able to feed some of the local industries number one and then um even people that want to come into nigeria mm. if you want to come into nigeria one of the things you ask yourself is will i have access to the right talent i mean look at dangote refinery they are bringing indians to come and do business there to come and work there yeah. and people are shouting why are you bringing it's true i mean do you have the local talent that can actually do those jobs or you think dangote would want to go outside and bring people and pay higher no, it doesn't make business sense. But the fact is, as a business person, as an entrepreneur, you go for where you can see the talent that will help you to deliver value. Because you make money when you deliver value. So that's exactly the thing that we should consider. And that, that ties into what you asked about the challenges that um, confront us um, as far as this program is concerned. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, last question. Uh, what advice would you give for someone that is watching this and really wants to 
coming to the program and what advice can you give the government to kind of make this program more effective for the student okay i would say this in three parts number one it's a good program it's a good initiative i mean training talent giving people skills mm. give a man a, a fish you feed him for one day give teach a man how to fish you feed him for a lifetime mm. now the, the this is a deliberate attempt to give Nigerians skill. I mean, if you look at our university education, I, when I was in this the university, I learned, the, the professor that taught me, unfortunately, used the material that he has been using for the past 40 years. The yeah, uh, yeah the, the same material, that's what he used to teach me. And you know that if, it, if it technology evolves very rapidly. So obviously, what I was taught is for the jobs of the past. So we have to begin to think about investing for the jobs of the future. And that is what 3 MTT represents. Technical talent. I mean, the, the courses are properly curated. Cybersecurity, cloud computing, AI, uh, you know, digital marketing, software uh, engineering, software development. You have blockchain development. You have skills of the future. Skills of today, skills of the future. That is what this program is is focused on so technical talents the second thing is when you do this you try to pull people out of unemployment mm -hmm. i mean if someone looked at the, recently the u.s bureau of labor statistics brought out a figure an employment figure of a 4.2 percent and it was a bit laughable uh, when you compare it with the unemployment situation in Nigeria. Mm. So this is an, I mean, unemployment, unemployment in Nigeria is emerging around 30%. If you had something close to that in the U.S., I mean, even the 4.3%, 4.2%, everybody's screaming their heads off. I mean, everybody's asking the Fed, you have to cut interest rate to be able to do what? To lower unemployment rate in the, in the U.S. So think about Nigeria. So I, I think this as an opportunity of really making Nigeria more competitive and reducing unemployment in the country. So unemployment, reduce unemployment is both an end in itself and a means to an end. A means to reducing the level of insecurity in the country. I mean, if you want to, if you go outside the country, the narrative we are hearing is Nigeria is sitting on a cake of gunpowder. Nigeria is a very insecure place. Because you have an army of people that are not educated, that are not uh, employed, that are unemployed. Yeah. And this represents a group of people that can be recruited for different nefarious activities. So uh, by doing this, you are, number one, equipping Nigerians with talent and you are feed, feeding them. Number two, you are reducing unemployment. And then the last thing is that you are reducing insecurity in the country so i think this is a very very bold step and i that's why for me i support this a hundred percent i mean when i was told about this like i told you i never applied to be part of the 3mtt yeah. program but when i was told that oh look you have to be part of training nigerians training the next group of nigerians that will become very successful world-class cyber security professionals i jumped on the offer because for me apart from the fact like i told you it tied with it tallied with my with my aspiration of training cybersecurity professionals, but I also thought of a way of making Nigerians to be more competitive in the global marketplace. So that is my take on the program. It's a very interesting program. I, I, I believe that the government will see it to an end and successfully train 3 million. Think about it. We have about, that would mean that almost, more than almost 10% of young Nigerian people in Nigeria yeah. Yeah, will, will be trained in, in technical talent. That, that would be, look at the, look at the, what I can call the domino effect. Yeah. If one person in the family is trained on tech and is successful, you don't need to tell the other ones to tow the line of tech. So you'll have, before you, that 3 million will represent another 10 million, another 6 million, another 10 million people that are into tech and I mean, we will be we will position Nigeria strategically to take up some of the rules that other people seem to, uh, you know, abandon in tech. Right. Uh, thank you so much. This has been a lovely session. Thank you for coming around and, and for the work you are doing. I I was at the class and I can tell you guys, I can see the effects and I believe this is going to uh, grow the Nigerian economy. This is going to boost talent. 
not just in the state, the state but Nigeria as a general. Uh, keep up the good work. Thank uh, you. Thank you. We believe that Nigeria will get to that uh, position. We can achieve development goals that we are looking at uh, through technology and cyber security. Thank you very much. Thank you so much Thank for coming. I uh, appreciate it. Thank you very much. Do you have any last words for, for okay, that? Okay, the last one will be, please, you guys need to keep on watching this channel. Yeah. Because, I mean, um, you are going to meet more people in tech and like the tech is the future really so if you want to get more inspiration people to tell you because i mean it could be very daunting you need to listen to things uh, watch videos like this to be able to build that resilience to push through the challenges around tech and uh, you will thank yourself for the decision you've made all right thank you, thank you for coming you. and we'll meet again next time thank you thank you thank you